came up here awful fast. <laughs> I tell you, this seemed like such a good idea when Craig called a while back. It don't seem like such a good idea right now. My name's Steve Mitchell. I'm an alcoholic. Steve. It's uh, good to be here. It's good to be sober. Good to be at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Um, what time's that clock say? 17 after. After what, 8? Yes. Yeah. It will take me about two, three hours here tonight. Um, I just asked the time to make you feel better. Um, I really am appreciative of being here. Um, I was out a little bit ago trying to walk off my nerves, and there was a lady walking. She was coming out. She got the mail out of her box and a couple blocks up the street, and she said, that's sure a big crowd down there. She said, you know, that's really a nice thing. And I said, well, that is. And I, I, I don't know why this popped in my mind, but I, I, uh, my sobriety date's May 26, 1975. I'm from Omaha. I've been in North Carolina about 25 years ago. But I was a member of the Amigos group in South Omaha. And South Omaha is pretty rough. It, uh, you're probably not going to get hit over the head during the daytime, but you wouldn't want to be walking around down there at night by yourself. And uh, Omaha is uh, heavily uh, ethnic, and it's the Mexicans and uh, the Polish people down there. And, my home group, uh, we were sitting in there one Thursday night, the Amigos group, and this door on the side opened. We didn't even know there was a door, and a man came through the door. He's, a, he's the new priest. And so we stopped the meeting right away, and he said, my name's Father Walensky. I'm the new pastor here. And uh, I just wanted to introduce myself, and I wanted to tell you how pleased I was when I got here. I found out there was an Alcoholics Anonymous group in a church that I would be pastoring. And he talked with us a little while, and essentially what he said, he said, you can be assured that I will do anything in my power to support you individually or collectively. And just before he left, he gave us one of those <laughs> deals, but he said, you should understand that what you're doing here tonight is right in the sight of God and man. And um, that's pretty much uh, what unity is. I, I know a lot about unity, and so do you whether we always practice it or not. The main thing I know about unity is what it says in the first tradition that most alcoholics can't recover without the group. That's about what I need to know. It's kind of like knowing what you need, what, what do you need to know about alcoholism? You don't need to know much. You need to know if you got it or not. That's, that's about what you need to know. Uh, but we were talking, I brought a couple bad cases of alcoholism with me and we were talking on the way down here in the car tonight, this afternoon, that once you get it clear, it seems to me, once I got it clear in my heart that there wasn't any place else for me to go in life, then unity became much more simple. i tell you a quick war story about that. Years ago, I was in North Carolina, but it was still years ago, I was a member of the principal's group of Wilson, and uh, we got a guy in town, a new guy in town, he's a good, good kid, he's, he's just out of the army, and he's like 23 years old, he'd been on a, Spent six years in the army, so he went into his 17 or something, something like that. He didn't have any family. He had a sister and a brother-in-law. And he came there, and, and uh, he's a good guy. He talked rough in, uh, in the meetings. And, and um, one night after the meeting, his name was Rick. We, we gave him the name Toothpick Rick. But I, I asked him, I said, can I talk to you a minute? And he said, well, sure. I said, uh, you mind if I make a suggestion? He said, no, not at all. What, what is it? I said, have you ever thought about cleaning your filthy mouth up? And he said, well, yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty good, pretty, pretty good deal. And the next, time, next meeting I saw him at, he said, can I talk to you for a minute after the meeting? I said, well, sure. He said, you mind if I make a suggestion? I said, what is it? He said, how about minding your own business? <laughs> And, uh, but he said the other night after that meeting, he said, I went home, and he said, I was pretty shook up. And I uh, thought about all the stuff, and then he said, about 2 o'clock in the morning, it came to me that I ain't got no place else to go. And that's really the, the truth of the matter. It seems to me that you could say correctly, and you might be able to say almost literally that the only way Alcoholics Anonymous works is a court of last resort. I can't imagine any self-respecting alcoholic having any other options would come to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
you have to get under the tent before this looks like a good deal. It don't look like a good deal before you get under here. The first time somebody su suggested I might go to AA, I thought, my God, has it come to that? <laughs> this just don't seem reasonable. But, but unity is an extremely important thing because in a way, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is a bit of a subculture. If that weren't true, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have closed meetings. And while it's good that people understand what we are, the ones who need to understand that is us. That in a very real sense, now this is not a negative statement, it's not a, a, it's not a bitter statement, it's just a fact of the matter. In a way, it's us against the world. Because the guy who's responsible for my sobriety is me. And if I don't know who it is I'm unified to, that's why Alcoholics Anonymous is such an important thing in the life of a recovered alcoholic like me. If I don't know what it is that I'm a part of, how in the world can I proceed in it? I understand unity. And that's why I think that sponsorship, in my mind, is right next to, to being married. I've had two wives since, I, since I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and recently, I, my wife and I got sideways about a thing. Now, this is something else I learned about unity. So you know how you just hate to hear those words. I'm a baseball fan. You know who Joe Torre is? He was the manager of the 80s for years. Well, he's been married to the same woman for years. And he said there's still one sentence that just sends chills through him every time he hears it. It's from his wife, Joe, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've gotten, my wife and I had gotten sideways with the thing. And so it had pretty well straightened out by the time she got around to lecturing me. But, but what she said, she said, it's your fault and my fault. She said, I'd like to say that it's all your fault. And I know you think it's all my fault. But it's not. It's both of our faults. Now, here's what I know about unity. I knew enough to keep my mouth shut. But I knew it was all her fault. <laughs> I mean, there ain't no doubt about that. I just knew it didn't make, I just wasn't a good thing to say. But I knew that. So I, I know about unity and, and, and I know about tradition. Um, you know, uh, Greg was just kind of talking a little bit about, he had some stuff to say and he was talking about traditions. Traditions are, I think, just that word seems to me that it implies comfort. And if you look at that and, you, and, and, and you, you look at, it always helps me to look at everything. I look at everything in, in my life in terms of prior to AA and after AA. And it, it makes perfect sense to me why people who are raised in alcoholism get so sick and so off track. You never know what the rules are. I mean, it's this way one time and 20 minutes later it's this way. And what traditions are, while they're not rules, they're extremely comforting and they give us some kind of a way to proceed. Not to take people outside and set on fire, but some kind of a way to proceed. You know, they're not things to beat people over the head with and they're not things to necessarily argue about, but they're guiding in their nature. And I have traditions and all kinds of things. I have traditions with my children. My children are grown with, with families of their own. A tradition I have, I can't hardly even, I don't even hardly, it, it, it almost won't work for me to say their names, that their birth names. I call them other names. I have traditions with all kinds of people, but, but they're very comforting. And what unity does is it, it makes me aware of what it is that I'm a part of. And you know, you'll hear people, I, I might have even said it myself at one time, I hope I never have, I don't ever remember saying it, but you'll hear in AA, it's a horribly misguided statement, but you'll hear people say that if I left AA, it wouldn't hurt AA, but it would hurt me. That's not true. We can't afford to lose anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only way we could afford to lose somebody is that there was two of them. Is everybody is necessary. And if we're going to move forward in life, I mean, we certainly need to know what it is that we're a part of and, and to be unified to that. So. As far as I can tell, besides good principled sponsorship, the greatest new, uh, need we have in Alcoholics Anonymous is good, effective three legacy groups. And when you look at three legacy groups, groups a, the, a fundamental difference between a group and a meeting is that a group has a life independent of the meeting. You know, the meeting lasts, even if you tie up a couple hours getting here, and you're only talking about two or three hours and I've got to go forth and live in the world. So, so it seems to me that, that meetings are just one thing that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, that AA is a way of life. 
and that that way of life is made up of many parts of a great whole, and at the pinnacle of that is the 12 steps. And that's why I like to believe that, that what Alcoholics Anonymous is, is the way of life a little bit more powerful than the illness of alcoholism. And what I think alcoholism means to me, I can't live with drinking and I can't live without drinking. That's what I think alcoholism means to me. The first time I heard anybody say that the majority of alcoholics who commit suicide do that sober, that made perfect sense to me. If I could have stayed drunk, I didn't have any problems when I was drunk. Now that's a strange thing. I had a lot of problems, but I wasn't aware of them most of the time. <laughs> Other people had problems. You know, it got to the point even people that sold booze didn't accept my drinking. <laughs> but anyway, that's a little bit about, I think, what we're doing here today. And I would just like to congratulate the folks that came together around uh, sense of, such a um, fine principle because, you know, alcoholism is a very lonely um, thing. And as my sponsor likes to talk about, I don't know if the loneliness of alcoholism is worse than other kinds of loneliness, but it's different. And that the proximity of people doesn't have anything to do with that. I was alone in the military. I was alone in my own family at Christmas time. I was alone when I was a child. And it seems to me that about every alcoholic I've ever heard come to one of these podiums has talked about being in serious trouble before they took a drink. There's a lady where I got sober that talked about, she always said it like right below her in her stomach there was like a big hole and it was like cold wind blew through there, and nothing could fill that up. That no matter how many people were around or whatever, she was always alone in a very real sense, and, and what filled that up was booze. And so, of course now, what has filled that up is, is the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, because just to take alcohol out and leave me the way I was would have been an absolute death sentence. You often hear, people say that of all the times in their life when they were just toughing out not drinking it was the worst it was the worst than it was worse than being drunk so it's an awfully difficult thing and you know when you when you start to negotiate our steps if you just take if you just bounce up there to step three you know it gives us a prayer on how to approach god but it essentially says the wording's optional it's the idea that you have to express but the whole thing leading up to that in the instructions is after ABC leading up to the prayer is about destruction of self-centeredness is what that is. It's a self-centered illness. I mean, we're, we're, we're driven by self-centeredness. And, and what that means to me, the reason I think that, that alcoholism, active alcoholism is so extremely self-centered, I don't think it's that we're incapable of having feelings or concern or anything. What I think it is, what that means to me, is that if push comes to shove, the bottle will always win. That it, no matter what kind of intentions I might have or whatever, the bottle will win. So if it's me and the bottle against the world, that's a pretty lonely place. If it's me and you against the rest of the world and against whatever problems are coming at us, because again, guys, we were coming down here today, we are talking about life comes at you sometimes at point blank range. And, and you, you, you just have to have some way of negotiating that. And what, what that's been to me is, is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's, it's a, a, a really, really powerful thing. Um, I'll tell you a little joke. I don't know if this is a joke or not. I'd appreciate it if you'd laugh when I'm done. Uh, <laughs> You know, where I'm from in Nebraska, people are Catholic about like they're uh, um, Baptist in North Carolina. And um, one night at the fights, this uh, every time the bell rang, the boxer stood up. You've seen athletes cross themselves like that? Like when they go to the free throw line or they step in the batter's box, they go like that. And, and there was a Catholic priest sitting down at ringside and he had his collar on and across the way there's always a drunk at the fights, at least one, probably a lot of drunks at the fights. But this guy kept watching the fighter, kept crossing himself like that every time the bell rang and so finally he wandered over to the priest and he said that that guy that keeps doing that, he said, that's one of your boys, ain't it? And the priest said, well, yes, he appears to be a, appears to be a Roman Catholic and he said, well, what does that mean? When he does that, he said, well, he's blessing himself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the drunk said, well, that help him. And the priest was a rather practical old priest, and he leaned back over and said, it'll help him if he can fight. <laughs> and uh, 
That's a lot the way Alcoholics Anonymous is. It'll help us if we do the stuff. And it won't help us if we don't do the stuff. I go to, uh, I go to a prison on Wednesday night. And um, we're there at the same time the religious volunteers are, and they're good guys. My favorite's a guy that's a retired uh, professor from NC State. He was a paratrooper when he was a kid. He was in the Marine Corps, and then he went in the Army, and he was a professor at State for 30 years. He's just a good guy. And uh, but they always want to know is how many of those, uh, they know we're there for Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, um, how many people are you helping? How many of the people does it, uh, does it work for? His name's Mike. I said, well, Mike, it works for all of them that do what they're supposed to do, and it doesn't work for any of them who don't. And, I mean, I don't want to hit you with anything too heavy here tonight, but that, that's pretty much what Alcoholics Anonymous is. It'll, it'll do what it's supposed to do if we apply the stuff that makes that happen. And if we don't, you would think, I mean, alcoholism's pretty illogical, but you would think half measures would get you at least half results. <laughs> it seems like they should. It just doesn't work that way. So anyway, enough of all that. Um, told you I'm from Nebraska. I grew up in alcoholism, come from a long line of alcoholics. My dad was as bad a case of alcoholism as I've ever seen or read about. Or, um, You know how people will say that, uh, you hear this in AA meetings all the time, they're talking about someone close to them in their family and they're obviously, they obviously think they're an alcoholic. But they'll say, I don't know why, but they'll say, I can't say they're an alcoholic because they never did. Well, there ain't many of those people in my family ever said they were, but I'm going to take a chance on saying it. <laughs> if they weren't alcoholics, they'll do till some come along. My dad detested Alcoholics Anonymous, and he wasn't any closer to believing he was an alcoholic at the end of his life than he was the first time somebody told him. He told one of my aunts, one of his sisters, he said, if anything would make a man drink, AA would do it. <laughs> and, uh, the first summer I was sober, he told me, he said, well, the problem with you, he said, you went from one extreme to the other. Now, I didn't know enough, but if I would have known enough, I'd have said, Dad, I think that's the idea here. <laughs> I mean, you used to be drunk, now you're not drunk. I'm pretty sure that's the idea, but I didn't know enough. But I grew up, and any speaker should, I don't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not an expert on alcoholism, I'm not a counselor, I'm nothing. Here's what I am. I'm one guy that Alcoholics Anonymous has worked awfully well for. And to the best of my ability, I've taken advantage of everything AA has to offer. Now I want to be careful how I say this, because it would be easy, easy to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not an expert on the 12 steps by any stretch of the imagination. Here's what I'm an expert on. I'm an expert on trying to apply those principles to the best of my ability. And this was a tremendous comforting experience. When I, I've had, um, besides dying on the street to my alcoholism, I've had two other major surrenders. I had a time at eight years and at 19 and a half years. Bill Wilson writes about it as the dark night of the soul. And I know that pain is very difficult to talk about. Pain is very difficult to understand, it's very difficult to, to, to remember, and it's just... The, what I can tell you about that time, those two times, is it may... I was homeless when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd been homeless for a while, I was very sick. But I can tell you that those two periods of time in sobriety made being homeless seem like kid stuff. And what I know is that when I was sober about 20 years, I had the most comforting thing, and it was born out of pain, as a lot of our stuff seems to me that it is, that, in fact, is you could probably, I mean, everything, I mean, if, if good doesn't come out of bad, then we're in a lot of trouble, because that's the only way an alcoholic gets sober. I mean, if you'd never been drunk, you wouldn't wake up in the morning and thank God for the gift of sobriety. It wouldn't make sense. You might wake up and thank God for a nice day if you're spiritually minded, but you certainly wouldn't thank him for the gift of sobriety if you'd never been drunk. But here's what happened to me at, at about 20 years of sobriety. It became apparent to me after some long inventory and deliberation and work, intensive close-up work with my sponsor, that I'd done the best I could in my sobriety and as, as, this is not an escapism, I'd also done the best I could do before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't very good, you can, you can certainly take that to the bank, but it was the best I could do. So if I was going to describe what I think alcoholism was and how I understand that when I was a kid, the one word that I think most clearly describes the illness of alcoholism, I think that word is fear. 
And I can remember to this day walking home from school as a little kid and just being scared. Tom talks about fear as everything from mild anxiety to abject terror and everything in between. But I can remember just being afraid. And I can remember thinking about that logically. And sometimes, you know how you can prove to yourself, you know, like we know after we get to Alcoholics Anonymous that logic doesn't work on a spiritual or an emotional or a mental problem. But, you know, I could prove to myself sometimes logically that there wasn't anything to be afraid of. But that doesn't move fear doesn't move that spiritual distraction. And I was just scared to death. I don't know what I was afraid of, but I always knew somehow that things were not the way that people were telling me they were. I always knew that there was more wrong with that. And I think I came into the world, some, just a mixed up child. I, I never learned how to read. I always knew how to read. I think I was born knowing how to read. I knew how to read really good. I knew how to read orally in front of groups of people really good. I knew what words meant that I didn't know how they meant. So I was fast-tracked in school. I mean, I'm smart, right? It wasn't to be the case. When I was in fourth grade, they introduced a thing called long division. And uh, they might as well have been talking to me in Swahili. It made no sense to me. I looked at that board. I couldn't anymore understand. And I think I was a textbook case. They took me to the principal's office after a while, and there was the principal in there, my teacher, and another lady a long time ago, so some kind of a counselor. And what they wanted to know is why wouldn't I do that long division? And I think it was the principal that said, you know how people will say things to you just to get you going, like, why won't you do this? You're smarter than I am. I think it was the principal that said that. I knew I couldn't do that long division. It was very confusing to me. If I'm so smart, how come I can't do that? Now, I've gotten a little bit arrogant over the years. I've wondered why anybody would want to know how to do long division now. <laughs> but it's just like some kind of confusing thing to me. As I look back on it, some of it makes sense. Like I had a terrible time learning how to tie my shoes. I couldn't learn how to tie my shoes. My dad had to show me another way. Eventually, I learned how to tie my shoes. But like I can't read a map. And I just detest to hear the words when somebody's telling you how to find someplace. You can't miss it. Oh yeah, I just hate, I've actually been on the heavy highway, pulled in some way to take a bad pee, got back in the car and went the wrong way. I mean, and just because I can find somewhere doesn't mean I can get back. I mean, if I get a flat tire, I'm down till you get there. I got a guy I sponsor, he actually swears that I called him over to my house to change a light. I don't think I did, I think he was there already. <laughs> But it was, it was one of those high ones with a tube and all that. But I mean, I just can't fix anything. And so it was just very confusing to me. If I'm so smart and I can read so well and I've been fast-tracked in school, how come I can't do this? It's really confusing. I was a really good athlete, but I had three things happen. It happened pretty much in the same success. I already had a bad attitude. I quit growing and I started drinking. Now, that'll put you down as far as sports go. And... Um, <laughs> It was just a, it was just a difficult time, I guess, would be the easiest way of talking about that. And, and um, I had drank before, but I had never been drunk outside of my home. And the first time I got drunk outside of my home, I heard a guy say that he, well, the first time he got drunk, he opened Pandora's box. And I think that's what happened to me. And, and um, now I'd had a little bit of experience with girls that I'd... Um, it wouldn't be fair to say I hadn't had any experience, but I wasn't sophisticated enough at that time to know that what other boys said they were doing with girls, they were either outright lying about it or they were over-speaking their progress. <laughs> Probably one or the other. And I'd had a little bit of success. I'd even, you know, done pretty good. Uh, that little neighborhood girl's about my age. Well, here's what happened. I'm a 15-year-old child. I got a job as an elevator operator at a place called the Pathfinder Hotel. Y'all, we've got some people in here that are old. We've got people in here tonight are about my great uncle's age. I see Daryl's here. Uh, but you remember those old elevators that you had to drive with a crank? Well, I was a 15-year-old child, and I was an elevator operator, and I got my first older woman on that job. And uh, she said that she had come in from the farm to look for a job, and she was 18 years old. Now, I don't know how old she was, but I'll assure you, she was way over 18. I was trying to help this little this kid. He's still sober, but I was trying to help this kid. He's, he got sober when he was 18, and he was in this class. And he went to the class one night, and he said this woman came up to him on the break. And I don't know how to say this. She just offered to handle him. 
And uh, she said, are you interested? He said, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and she told him she was 27 years old. Now, when we saw her, she might have been 37, is the truth of the matter. And I don't know how old that woman was back at the Pathfinder Hotel when I was a 15-year-old child, but here's what I know. If alcohol makes something like that happen, you ain't going to give it up very easy. That's what I know. You got a 15-year-old child that can't get through his own name in an introduction, and then you get drunk, or you're drinking, and something like that happens? Merciful Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you just aren't going to give that up very easy. And they were selling three quarts of beer for a dollar at that time back in Nebraska. Pretty rank stuff, old Milwaukee and Falstaff, but it ain't exactly like you're drinking for taste. I mean, it's kind of like sitting around the bar about midnight, you're in there talking to your best friend, another doctor or airline pilot that you met an hour or two ago. I mean, it's, it's, the stuff isn't exactly about taste and honesty, is it? So I found out that by drinking, things happened that didn't happen if I wasn't drinking. And while drinking caused me trouble right from the very beginning, it caused me things like minor imposition, public intoxication, disturbing the peace, trouble at home, uh, trouble with my little girlfriends or whatever it was, it was well worth it. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And if alcohol still did what it did for me when I was a 15 or 16 year old child, there'd have been no reason to quit drinking. Was it problem filled? It was problem filled, but it was well worth the problems. The problem was with that is that just, you know, alcoholism's just like sobriety is progressive in nature. If we practice spiritual principles and continue to grow in the grace of God and the program our founders gave us, we continue to get better. We get paid off in peace and serenity and ability to help others and look at the world in a different way. Well, I was a long ways from that then. The, what was progressing was the, was the illness of alcoholism, and that was in a full-blown thing, and it just took off. And um, there's a lot of money in my family, none of it close to me. I was raised in a, uh, probably a middle-class family, hard-working people, but, but riddled with alcoholism. But if you get away from my immediate family on both sides, there's real, real big money. I have a great aunt and uncle, now dead, but they have their name on a giant building at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And I was at an AA thing up in the uh, Northeast. And it was, there was, I was at a picnic on Saturday afternoon, a lady sitting next to me. She's just a member of AA, but in her job, she was a vice president of finance at the local college, and I was telling her about this building. My great aunt and uncle had their name on it at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, which essentially means they paid for it. And I said, I guess you'd have to give a couple, three million to get that at a, at a big place like that, wouldn't you? And she started laughing. She said, no, you'd probably have to give like 12 or 15 million dollars, or something like that. So, and I don't want to make the implication that any of that money was ever earmarked for me. It never was. But there was a way out. One of my drunken uncles took it. And, I mean, there was a way out. There was an opportunity to be moved into, to get an education, to get a trade, that they would see to that, and, and all of those things. And they were in California, so I started going to California. People where I'm from go to California. People from Nebraska, where I'm from at that time, went to California to start their life over. Now, you can imagine my consternation. I did that a number of times, but here's the problem. Every time I got to California, I was there. So, you know, nothing changed. And um, one time, you know, there's a couple places in our literature, and you can certainly hear in AA meetings about how smart alcoholics are. But there's a couple places in our literature, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a couple places that flirt with that idea. It says something about... Isn't the alcoholic usually bright and he, he builds his family up? And it says something about he pulls it down with a senseless series of sprees or something like that. I was hitchhiking one time. I had a, I'd written a bunch of bad checks, and I was hitchhiking from Lincoln, Nebraska to San Gabriel, California, which is a part of Los Angeles. I told you I'm a little directionally troubled. Well, I got to a place called Little America, Wyoming, and a guy picked me up and took me to Portland, Oregon and dropped me off. I'm now further from Los Angeles than where he got me. And that's, that's pretty much how you could describe my alcoholism. It was just on and on and on. And, uh, but anyway, I, uh, I went off in the military. I, I, again, I was in trouble with the law, and they let me go off in the military. And I, uh, I paid a very dishonest recruiter. Um, he told me to get all the money together that I could find and he would get me in the military and I know that what he did with that He stuck it right in his pocket. I'll tell you how much it was and I'll tell you the United States Air Force got cheated on it, too It was sixty five dollars 
is what it was. And I went off in the military and I cheated on the test to get in there. And uh, I got out of basic training and uh, I was in San Antonio, Texas, and I got orders that said I'm going to Wichita Falls, Texas to learn how to work on airplanes. Now I told you, I can't at that time, I don't think they had self-service gas pumps, but if they did, I couldn't have worked them. And they're going to have me work on airplanes. and and. Um, <laughs> You just have to wonder about the, the, how, uh, the, the brains of the Air Force at this time. They got us all together. We're there for that school, and they said, it's your basic rah-rah talk. I know that today. But they said, you're one step closer to the regular Air Force now. And this weekend, you're going to be allowed to go anywhere in downtown Wichita Falls, Texas. You would like to go, with the exception of Flood Street. And the reason you can't go on Flood Street is because it's been made off limits by order of the base commander. Well, you know what I did. I got drunk and went down on Flood Street to find out why they don't want you down there. <laughs> and I got arrested down there for public intoxication. And at that time, they always threatened you in the airplane patch that if you didn't do your school, they'd turn you into a cook or a cop. Well, I got kicked out of that school, but I couldn't have done that school if they'd have put just one person in charge of me, trying to be, a, you know, a lot of us grew up under that deal. If you can't do something, try hard enough. That's a lie. <laughs> That'd be about like me learning how to drink. I mean, it just ain't going to happen. I'm not going to learn how to work on things. It just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And, um, but anyway, I ended up in the state of Arkansas, and this was in the late 1960s, and the civil rights movement was going on, and, and I, was just, I was just drunk. Now, the military didn't do anything. I was already a full-blown alcoholic when I went in there as a child. The only thing the military did is it created an environment where it might have sped it up a little bit because you would think that there'd be a lot of authority and discipline, but it was just out, pretty much out the window and we were just drunk. And I was in Arkansas, I got arrested for minor in possession, then I got arrested for public intoxication, then I got arrested for drunk driving. And they actually gave me a choice whether I wanted to get out of the military. I think they called it a 3912 discharge. It's a general discharge. And they actually gave me a choice if I wanted to get out on that or take my shipment. But I had a shipment to Vietnam, so I went off to Vietnam, and, and uh, it's just kind of a blur. I was there from, uh, uh, I was in Vietnam from January of 70 to January of 1971, and a lot of times if guys, especially now, it seems like the paper's talking more about it, and there's, if people are talking about, if a bunch of guys are talking about Vietnam or anything, I don't even say I've been there, because if they ask me any questions, I mean, what are you going to say? You'd have to talk to somebody that was really there. I, mean, I was there, but I don't know much about what happened. I was just drunk, and um, my drinking, it just, it, it, it took off, and it was, I'm now sick in the mornings when I wake up. I'm sick when I don't drink, and I went on, I went and talked to a doctor one time. I used to get these horrible, horrible cramps, and he asked me a bunch of questions about drinking, and uh, I actually told him, he said, you drink when you wake up? I said, yeah, some of my best drinking, and I asked him a few other questions, so he yeah, I answered the questions truthfully. You know what he put down on a piece of paper? He diagnosed me with food poisoning. <laughs> I said, I don't think it's that, doctor. I ain't eating much. But, uh, but my alcoholism is in full bloom now. Now I'm going to rush this ahead. There's a place in the book Alcoholics Anonymous where it says that there's um, the drinking career of every alcoholic has some stuff happen that's hilarious and it has some stuff happen that's tragic. Now, I would submit that most of alcoholism certainly is not hilarious and most of it's not tragic. Now, it may be tragic to the sufferer over the long haul, but on a, on a regular basis, it's probably just nasty. It's probably just an erosion. It's not tragic. I'm going to tell you one thing that's hilarious, and then I'm going to tell you one thing that's tragic, and then I'm going to shove on and, and uh, be mindful of our time here. Now this, now, this story is a little bit sensitive. My sponsor's here. I've, I've told this story... I don't know how many times in the last 38 plus years, a lot of times. It's just a story. It's a little bit sensitive, but it's just a story. That's all it is. And, and I only got in trouble for telling it once. There was a very uh, large lady up in uh, Rhode Island that, that just didn't think the stunt funny was story. So it, it, it's just a story. I was glad that Tom was there because he said, don't pay any attention to that junk. If you want to tell that story, just tell it. But one night, I'm in Spokane, Washington, and I have this woman with me. Now, we were driving a large white car. We drove it to a bar. Now, this woman was not, how would I say? She was not unattractive. She, however, was old. 
And uh, one night, we, we, were all, we were in Decatur, Alabama one night, and a lady right down in the front row said, you mean mature, don't you? And I said, no. No, I don't mean mature. Well, here's what happened. We went in the bar, and then a couple hours later, we were seen coming out of the bar. Most of this story was pieced together for me by the highway patrol. We came out of the bar, and we got in a large white car and left. In those days, I never took the keys out of a car. The only problem was it was not the large white car we drove to the bar. And so I was arrested for um, auto theft and drunk driving. And I, I, I could understand the drunk driving, but it took me a while to figure out how I could have got arrested for auto theft. I mean, I didn't know what had happened. We were just driving off in a white car. And, uh, but the next morning, they let us out of jail, and, and um, it's the only time I'd ever been in jail. They put this woman and I in the same jail cell together. That's all they had in that little country town was this little bitty jail cell. And the patrolman and this night marshal was there, went to work on trying to get to the bottom of what had happened. Well, the next morning, they let us out of jail. And I'll never forget this if I live to be a thousand years old. I was standing in front of the jail, and the patrolman was saying, she'll have to drive you're still too drunk. And I'm sure I was saying to him, you're right, boss. And you know how they talk to you? How they poke you like that? And in my size, you know, he stood over me. Well, this woman, she's probably back there about that sign. She's walking towards the car. And um, she's got on these little bitty white shorts. About half her butt's coming out of the bottom of those shorts. At least half. And um, I, I'm, well, he lets me go, so I'm walking. And I don't know why I did, but I'm about between that sign and this podium and the patrolman standing in front of the jail like this. And I stopped and turned around and looked back at the patrolman. And when I did, our eyes locked. You know how your eyes will lock with somebody? Like in an AA meeting or a library or something, your eyes just lock? Well, our eyes just locked like that. And I saw that patrolman, he went. <laughs> And um, <laughs> now, I wasn't able to at that time, but if I had been able to, I'd have said, buddy, those are my sentiments exactly. <laughs> and to be honest now, that woman had about the same thing on her hands with me. And, um, but anyway, that became hilarious later. I guarantee you it wasn't hilarious that day. And I'll tell you one story that I will just consider tragic. This one isn't so funny. I was, when I came back from Vietnam, I became involved with some people that were outside the long arm of the law. And um, I'm not going to take a fifth step. You wouldn't want to hear it. It would be improper. It would just say that, that, that they were just outside the long arm of the law. And my plan was was to get out of the military and come back to Nebraska for about a week and then return to the state of Washington and fall in full time with them. I've always been grateful in that respect that by this point my alcoholism was, was too far gone. I guess if you have to have alcoholism, I've always been grateful. I didn't have the kind where people are able to maintain. You know, you work with somebody that can go to work every day and pay their bills, and I don't know, I don't think functional alcoholic's probably a proper word, but it, it puts you in mind of what I'm talking about. I'm grateful I never had that kind. People that have my kind of alcoholism don't get very old, or they get, you know, if, they're, if you either get locked up or you die or something, killed, whatever it is. But, but anyway, because of alcoholism, because of hatred, and because of the way I was living, I was a good bit responsible for the death of another person. Now, I don't think it would be honest to say that that didn't bother me, but it didn't bother me the way it was going to come to later. I think what it did is it just put me to another level. You know how it's true that whatever you send out comes back, like it says in our book, that the wrongdoing of others has the power to actually kill. So, you know, if you're, if you're bitter and resentful, I mean, that, that garbage comes back to you. But it's a bad law that doesn't work both ways. One of the wonderful things about our program if you look at it like this, that I'm still sober today, then that means that everything I've ever done in Alcoholics Anonymous has been successful in terms of every, every um, low life I've ever picked up after or tried to work with or every call I've ever made, every time I've ever went to the halfway house, every coffee pot I've ever cleaned or whatever has made it worthwhile because I'm sober. If you look at it this way, it seems to me the best I can tell 
there's only two things we do. There's a thousand things we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, but as far as I can tell, everything we do in AA is for one of two reasons. It's to stay sober or to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now, we may do a thousand different things to do that. So it's a bad law that doesn't work both ways. While the wrongdoing of others, fancied or, kill has, fancied or real, has the power to actually kill, I don't have to help somebody to be helped. My job is to try to help them. If I'm powerless over my own alcoholism, the safeguard on working with others is I'm powerless over theirs. You know, I went to a thing one time, my kids used to go to, um, well, I won't bore you with all that, but they, the school they used to go to, the president of, we were in Omaha, the president of Boys Town came to speak to the, to the, the parents, the association. If your kids went there, they invited you, and they, he came to speak, and he, he said that, you know, Boys Town's a nationally known organization, he's been there for years, he said this very week, he had them with him, he had two letters with him. One was from a B-58 fighter pilot who had just got his own command. He had just been promoted from lieutenant colonel to grown bull colonel, and he had become a, a commander of his own squadron. And he was thrilled, and he wrote the president of Boys Town that said the only thing, Father, that made that possible was the, um, what I had been introduced to at Boys Town. I was given a place, I was taken away from people that didn't want me, couldn't take care of me, and I was put in with decent, hard-working families, and I was raised, and I was taught good values, and I was given a wonderful chance in life. He read the second letter, and it was from a guy who had been, who'd been raised at Boys Town, had been in and out of prison all his life, and he had just gotten a life sentence in the state of Michigan, by the way, Tom. He had just gotten a life sentence, and essentially he said in the letter he wanted the president of Boys Town to know, even though he wasn't running in Boys Town at the time this guy was there, he wanted the president of Boys Town to know that the reason he'd been in trouble with the law all his life is because of the way he was raised at Boys Town. Well, he, he raised a good point. He said, what do you do with all that? He said, the folks at Boys Town, just like the folks there today, I'm sure they did what, everything they could for both. So if I'm powerless over my own alcoholism, I'm certainly powerless over anybody else's. But anyway, I know now that with that experience and that tragedy, I just sunk to a lower level and my life became worse and I went on. I got out of the military. If you've been in the military, you know there's two people that have, they're packing a lot of power. One's a chaplain, another one's a medical doctor. And there was a medical doctor who kept me from getting kicked out of the military and he was a good guy, he just didn't know anything about alcoholism. But I got out of the military in the summer of 1972. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous almost three years later to stay. I only worked six weeks in that period of time, so it was some pretty lean time. I'm headed for the home stretch on this, but I want to tell you one big difference between drinking in North Carolina and drinking in Nebraska. There are bars everywhere in Nebraska. There's just very few in North Carolina compared to speaking. I used to, I, I, uh, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous started to move in my life in a place called Bill's Bar. Now I'm going to tell you real quick about Bill's Bar. Bill's Bar was a bar where you could have backed a farm truck up to it and put everybody in there and took them to Alcoholics Anonymous. You wouldn't have missed a person. You had to be drunk to stand it in there. The people that worked in there were drunk. Bill had made his fortune in the garbage and septic tank business and he bought that bar as a toy for his drunken wife Phyllis. We had some colorful characters in there. We had a guy named Vibrator Hartman. And a vibrator got drunk one New Year's Eve and burned up in a fire. We had a guy named Rodney Montaigne. And Rodney got drunk. He got in a fight with a guy in a wheelchair. Tipped him over. And what Rodney said is, he hit me a good one, Steve, but I tipped him over before they got me out of there. <laughs> and we had a guy named Leonard Larson. Now, Leonard had no neck. His head sat right on his shoulders. And what Leonard would do is he'd get drunk and crawl around on his hands and knees and lift bar stools to perform feats of strength. Leonard went out in the country one day. Nebraska, metropolitan Omaha is hilly and big, and you got the big red football machine in Lincoln. But Nebraska's flat, and it's farm country and ranching and railroad and tractor trailer, and there's a lot of old laws on the books. Leonard went out in the country one day and shot a cow. He stumbled out the country road to get somebody to help him load it on his pickup truck. He waved down an off-duty deputy sheriff. Got one to two years for that. I don't know how many of you in here, I know Larry and Tom have, if you've ever been to Blackstone in Virginia, they got a, it's an old girls college and the speakers, they put them up on a, on a, a stage. And I only was there once, I was there on a Saturday night, and my wife was with me. Now she's not an alcoholic, but it's, it's just a good idea for me to do what she says. 
I've, I'd already climbed up on there. It was only about a minute or two before the meeting started, and they had a place for her to sit. Well, she came out in the aisle and called me down there. So I came down here and I said, what is it? And she said, I don't want to hear one word out of you about that guy with no neck. <laughs> and I thought, what's wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? What are you talking about? And she said, I mean it. Not one word. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, look at that guy over there. He ain't got no neck. <laughs> But anyway, the two most colorful guys came in that bar about the same time I got out of the military were two brothers named Billy and Tommy Walker. And they got there about the same time I did. Now, when I met them, Billy Walker told me he was just out of the 101st Airborne. I knew that day that that was a lie, and I know today that that was a lie over 40 years later. There's symptoms to that stuff, just like if you got a girlfriend that's married but she doesn't tell you, there's symptoms to that. There are symptoms to, Billy Walker was coming from a penitentiary somewhere, there's no doubt about that. Now, I'm a beer drinker, but I'll drink anything. And there was literally a time when I could drink beer for 24 or 30 hours, I'd be drunk, but I could talk to people, I could remember what had happened, I could drive a car, I'd have some kind of ability to operate. But you let me take one drink of whiskey or mad dog wine with that, I just never remember. Well, when they came to town, now Billy Walker drank dry gin and chased it with squirt. Tommy Walker drank bar whiskey and chased it with water. When I started drinking with him, I started drinking that uh, dry gin and squirt. This is the kind of brains you had in Bill's bar at this time. One reason I like this story is that this is where I started to make my move towards Alcoholics Anonymous, which proves that God can do his work anywhere. Uh, I mean, it, anywhere, penitentiary or Skid Row or the White House or anywhere else. Right in Bill's Bar, down the road a ways, is where my life started to move towards Alcoholics Anonymous. But this is the kind of brains you had in Bill's Bar at that time. Billy Walker said, there's a couple things you got to remember the way we're drinking this gin. He said, you always get the gin in a shot glass, and then you get another glass full of squirt. And squirt's just a kind of soda. And he said, you never breathe when you drink the gin. You drink it down real quick, but don't breathe. And then as soon as you swallow it, chase it with a squirt. And the reason you don't want to breathe, he said, it's nasty and it can make you gag. Well, you know, if you get a good whiff of that dry gin sober, it'll just send chills through your body. I mean, it's nasty. You have to be about half drunk to drink it. <laughs> and um, the other thing he said, I said, okay, Billy, that's fine. That makes sense. The other thing he said is you've got to start to use a lot of pepper on your food. Now that, even as sick as I was, that threw me. I said, well, what will that do? He said, well, the way we're drinking this gin, it's been known to hurt your liver, but if you use a lot of pepper on your food, it'll counteract the damage. <laughs> now, there was a couple reasons I like to drink with those guys. One reason is when I was drinking, I had a big mouth. Now, there wasn't anything going to happen to me in Bill's bar. Phyllis wouldn't put up with it. But we'd get drunk and wander off. Well, when I got sober, I went up a pant size a year my first few years, but Billy Walker never was any bigger than I am right now. But he would attack people. He looked like that dog on the Greyhound bus. He'd fly on people and knock them out. And the other reason I like to drink with Billy Walker, I've seen a lot of guys in my life that could get a lot of women, but I've only seen two that what it looked like to me is they attracted women. They didn't have to do anything. They just did whatever they did, and then women somehow showed up, and Billy Walker was one of them. So as I look back on it now, I must have just been drunk, not stupid, because my plan was I'll stay here and get in on some of the overflow. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I'm going to fast forward to the Thanksgiving season, 1974. I'm headed towards the home stretch now if you're getting antsy. Uh, Thanksgiving season 1974 I had just come back from California and I'm, I'm real sick now I'm that kind of sick where I remember stuff but I don't know if it really happened or not and there was a lady in Bill's bar I'd been in a terrible tractor trailer accident with this guy horrible wreck where have you ever seen one of those wrecks where everybody should have been killed and nobody got a scratch it's just it's almost unfathomable how that could have possibly happened but it was a horrible wreck with a tractor trailer and a woman with a car, a station wagon and a carload of kids. I was in the sleeper of the truck and slept through the whole thing. But the guy that was driving the truck and I were invited to this house, this lady and her boyfriend's house for Thanksgiving dinner. Now they were members, they were permanent party in Bill's bar too. So Libby had a great big beautiful Thanksgiving dinner and she had her kids in and, and um, I mean she, she really went all out. I couldn't eat. I, I, I'm this kind of sick now. I wake up, I'm drenched in my own sweat, but I'm freezing. Every time I go to the bathroom, blood comes out. I vomit, blood comes out. 
Libby's bringing in beer for me to drink. I think I'm going to get some to stay down. I get sick again. Libby had a talk with me that went very much like this. She said, I've been around alcoholics all my life. I've been married to two alcoholics. You've got to remember now, Libby's permanent party at Bill's Bar, too. And she said, but I don't think I've ever seen anything like you at your age. And she said, there's a man in town who helped my last ex-husband. My last ex-husband's now been sober one year. He's got a full-time job. He's paying his child support. He's doing really well. If you want me to, I'll call him. And um, that was right around Thanksgiving, November 30th, 1974. A guy by the name of Bob Brannigan made the first call that was ever made on me. He spent all Saturday afternoon with me. I don't remember much of it. I remember a couple things. He told me the story of what he, what, if you want to know about the, the wisdom of our founders, if you ever wonder what is it a newcomer needs to know, a newcomer needs to know what we used to be like, what happened to us, and what we're like now. And if you ever wondered if singleness of purpose is important or not, all you have to do is read Dr. Bob's story whether he at, where he asked that rhetorical question, what is it that the man who made the call on him did that was different? When Bill Wilson came to see him, he answers his own question. He said he talked, he talked, he knew all the answers about drinking and certainly not because he picked them up in his reading. So no identification, no Alcoholics Anonymous. But anyway, I asked a couple questions. I asked that guy, how long since you've drank? He said, if I can make it till September, it'll be 11 years. I, and I, the other question I asked him, I said, how do you get the willpower to not drink? And I remember what he said with that. He said, I look on willpower a little bit different than you do. What I think willpower means is the way you take that drink, knowing it's going to come back up. That's what I think willpower is. And the next day, December 1st, 1974, he carted me off to the state hospital. What I remember about that trip is a couple, three hours, I was very sick and I needed a drink really bad. I didn't get one. He bought me a carton of cigarettes and a can of 7-Up. And I laid that great line on him, you know what it was, I'll pay you back. And I remember him looking over at me. It was a little more than just glancing over. It was, he, he, he lingered a bit when he looked. He said, that ain't the way this works. You'll be expected to help someone else when you're able. And that's what I'd like to think I've been trying to do all this time since then. But anyway, it was going to be about six months between then and when I quit drinking. And how that happened is I woke up Memorial Day weekend, 1975. I had two bottles of dark port wine hidden, but I couldn't find them. I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and um, the guy who did find him and drank him is now dead. I don't guess they killed him. It didn't help him much. But I didn't remember much about that drunk. A couple, three days later, I saw one of the guys I'd been drinking with, and I said, well, what happened? He said, well, we were riding around, and he said, you were drunk. And he said, Richard told you three or four times to shut up. You wouldn't shut up, so he hit you right in the mouth. I said, he did? He said, yeah, he hit you hard, too. And I said, what did I do? He said, you started crying. <laughs> But anyway, long story short, we're headed for the home stretch. Remember now, they didn't get me up here right at 8 o'clock. It was quite a... Um, my great aunt took me in, and um, it was a wonderful way to get sober. I began to... I got sober. I, I woke up at 2 a.m., May 26, 1975. From that moment to this moment, I've never had another drink. And I began to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was explained to me, and the longer I've been sober and the more I've seen of Alcoholics Anonymous and how far we've drifted from our essential purpose and from the power of Alcoholics Anonymous and from what it is as we move towards trying to be all things to all people and who shot John and if you're not an alcoholic, just say you're one and all of that kind of nonsense. I, I'm more and more grateful that I fell under the care of the people that I did. They said Alcoholics Anonymous is a written program. It's passed on by an oral tradition, but it's written down. If you practice these principles to the best of your ability, not only will you not drink, it's impossible to drink. Could I get drunk? Of course I could get drunk. There's people in here sober a lot longer than me. They could get drunk. Any alcoholic could get drunk. I'm not going to just walk off and get drunk. I'm protected by the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. If, think of it this way. If Alcoholics Anonymous was not more powerful than the illness of alcoholism, if it were not, then what you would have is a crapshoot. You would have people, I, I, so far, right up to this moment, this is just my experience, I've never seen one single person return to drink that put these principles first in their life. No matter what the tragedy, no matter what the provocation, no matter what the reversal. One thing Alcoholics Anonymous will not do is it will not protect you from life coming at you. That's going to happen. 
But what it will do, it will, it will give us a way. Not only have I not, I, anybody that's put these principles first, is not only as I know, have, my experience, has not drank, they've been able to come through with some equanimity and be able to face life. So that's been my experience, and, and um, I've been very, very grateful. I've had all the things that anybody else has had happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head for the home stretch with this thought. There's a, I've made about every mistake I guess that an alcoholic could make, but there's, there's a couple, three I've never made. Here, here's one mistake I've never made. I've never took a drink since I got sober. I've never quit going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've never trusted the wrong person. So far as I know, I've never had a confidence violated in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I've had people say stuff that didn't mean anything. One of the great things about AA is you get to pick your leaders here. I had some management training one time that said, if you work for a man or woman that you wouldn't hire if the shoe was on the other foot, you're going to have a problem every time. I, I, I'm retired from state government, and I guarantee you they had me under some people I wouldn't have had plugging lamps in if I'd have had a choice. And I had trouble, too. They did, too. <laughs> but if in Alcoholics Anonymous, you get to pick who you follow. And the people that I've followed have been absolutely committed to this program and to these principles. They've never, with, I, I've known Tom a long time, and I know, you, you can't love someone until you know what's wrong with them. Otherwise, it's just all fluff. She's got a nice butt, or he's a good athlete, or got a lot of money. It's just fluff. You have to know, the, the greater cause for intimacy, then the greater you know what's what's wrong with them as well. But one thing Tom has never, ever equivocated on, that the power of Alcoholics Anonymous is quite enough. It's enough to take me all the way to the wire. So anyway, you've been very kind in listening to me tonight. I appreciate that. Um, God bless you and thank you for my life.